Welcome to Progenesis Academy webinar, session 40. Today's topic, overview of egg and embryo vitrification, media, tools, and techniques. This session has five PowerPoint presentation. Um, each one will last about five to seven minutes. And the presentation will be followed by a round table discussion. So I would encourage each one of you to submit your question through the chat or or comments. And uh, let me introduce the panel of speakers we have today. So we have with us Dr. Keskin Tepe. He is the lab director at West LA IVF Clinic. We have Dr. Baileys. He is the lab director at Utah Fertility Center. We have Dr. Amadi. He is the lab director at USC Fertility. And we have Dr. Sadruddin. She is the lab director at Dallas IVF. And we have Dr. Anderson, lab director at Aspire Fertility and embryodirector.com. Thank you so much. So our first presentation would be by Dr. Keskin Tepe. Levant, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nabi, uh, for inviting me for this uh, session. And uh, I apologize about my voice and since sun uh, Sunday, I have a sore throat, although I got my vaccination, but for some reason I got a uh, uh, terrible uh, cold. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, oocyte and embryo freezing and what we have done since 2004, and I'm going to bring uh, up today and what we are doing today. So, can I change it or? Uh, Levant, if you can increase your uh, voice a little bit, that would be appreciated. Okay. How about right now? Yes. Okay. So, uh, as we know, uh, conventional freezing was not very effective for uh, 2pm cleavage stage uh, embryos and blastocysts. And our success rates were somewhere between 20% uh, to up to 40-45% uh, pregnancy rate and the delivery rates uh, somewhere around 30 to 40%. For all sites, uh, traditional uh, success rates uh, less than 10%. Uh, also, it, it was considered little for the all sites. Uh, we try to freeze uh, these oocytes at the immature oocyte stage, uh, and one stage or the GV stage, uh, we had a very poor outcome. Another way of uh, preserving the uh, oocytes uh, or the tissues, or your tissue, however, this required uh, at least two uh, laps of uh, surgeries, and we had only very few libraries, and. Uh, we had uh, high loss of follicular uh, loss. Uh, if we try to explain in one sense what we are doing in vitrification, in uh, all site and embryos, we expose them in the, uh, into the uh, multimolar uh, color protecting agent, and we are cooling down to sub zero temperatures and we remove all waters, uh, uh, all waters and uh, trying to change the cell to the solid phase. CPA is, uh, or cryoprotective agent, is highly water soluble low weight molecules that are non-toxic uh, sub-zero temperatures to cells. Um, they are easily uh, passed through the zona pellucida. Can we go back uh, one more slide? Uh, please, yeah, over here. Okay, oops. Can we go back, uh, Riley? Yes. Okay. Uh, this slide. Uh, basically shows uh, the differences between the commercial uh, uh, freezing and vitrification. On the left side, uh, there are ice formation, 
and on the right side is the solidification of the solids. And uh, in this uh, process, we are trying to put the cryoprotectant inside the cell and while we are taking the uh, water outside and just trying to sol uh, sol uh, solidify the uh, tissue. So, uh, important point for successful uh, blastosis vitrification. Uh, blastosis quality is uh, very important, especially during the uh, development stages. Uh, fragmentation is important uh, parameter for us. And uh, developmental uh, stage is important. If we freeze the day five versus day six, uh, we are getting a better success rate in the day 5 uh, embryos versus day 6. During the uh, ratification, uh, collapsing the blastosis, trying to, uh, we are trying to help the embryos to vitrify, although this is somehow controversial because there are some, uh, there are programs that they are doing without uh, uh, collapsing uh, of the blastosis. That the idea is that you know uh, we are trying to get rid of the uh, uh, get rid of the blastocytic fluid from the uh, 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 from the blastocyst and reach the high uh, freezing rate. And uh, we are uh, uh, after following, uh, we are hatching the uh, embryos, uh, especially trying to cut. Uh, minimum one third of the zona pellucida, helping embryo to get rid of the uh, zona pellucida because vitrification certainly causes uh, the uh, zona pellucida hardening. Uh, re expansion time is important. Uh, we culture them at least for the six hours uh, after the thawing, and we know that uh, faster expansion time is the better. When we started in 2004, uh, five uh, blastosis vitrification, and we were uh, preparing our own media, and uh, we were using our uh, culture uh, media, and we were preparing two solutions: 7.5% DMSO and 7.5% ethylene glycol, and we are uh, uh, exposing the embryos three to four minutes for this solution in 500 microliter uh, solution. After this, uh, this uh, uh, solution, uh, we are transferring them 15% DMSO and 15% ethylene glycon, 1% sarcos for 60 to 90 uh, seconds, and we are plunging into liquid nitrogen. All these manipulations are done at uh, 37 centigrade, and uh, it was quick freezing and uh, survival was uh, great. Warming of the embryos, uh, we thought embryos at 37 centigrade, uh, one molar surplus for one minute, then move them to 0.5 molar surplus, uh, three to four minutes, and uh, finally we move the embryos to hit this buffer media for six minutes. In uh, 2015 or 2016, when the commercially available uh, medi media starts selling in the United States, we start moving them. And right now, we are using commercially available vitrification solutions and uh, warming solutions, and we follow their uh, vitrification uh, and uh, warming protocols. So uh, this is one of our initial uh, uh, studies that uh, we published in 2006. Uh, with the, uh, we compared the vitrification versus the uh, slow uh, the conventional uh, freezing method. Group uh, one is the uh, slow uh, or the conventional group. Group B is the uh, vitrification group and uh, we divided each group in two. Uh, A is the uh, without any PGD, and group B is the PGD group, and uh, 
as you see that uh, uh, we had uh, uh, higher uh, uh, pregnancy rate with the uh, vitrification plus uh, PGD group and implantation rate is significantly higher in uh, vitrification plus uh, vitrification plus PGD group. This is the initial uh, study that we did in our centers uh, that time in 2006-2007. And uh, I, I, I like to mention a little bit about the oocyte uh, vitrification. Why oocytes are more sensitive to temperature change and vitrification? Because oocytes are arrested at the second meiotic uh, division and two stage and they had uh, a spindle, uh, uh, bipolar spindle uh, in their structure and this uh, spindle uh, is uh, very sensitive to temperature changes and they are uh, depolymerized uh, uh, below 37 centigrade and uh, when we do the vitrification uh, with all sides uh, they are better than the slow freezing or the conventional freezing because uh, uh, vitrification protects all sides from the detrimental changes and uh, uh, we are using lower uh, CPA concentrations and this don't allow the physiolog physiological changes and also uh, lower CPA concentrations do not allow the sperm binding uh, properties on all sides. In our first studies, uh, we tried multiple uh, uh, step uh, for the vitrification all sides, and again we are using uh, DMSA and ethylene glycol. And in a multiple step approach, we started two percent uh, DMSA and ethylene glycol and we increased uh, up to 10 percent and then final stage we uh, put them at 20 percent MSO and 20 percent ethylene glycol for 30, 30 seconds and then we plunge them to liquid nitrogen. Oocyte warming is uh, we started 1.5 molar sucrose because there was a uh, sudden uh, re-expansion of oocytes uh, when you put them in the sucrose solution, there was a uh, water uh, rush into the oocyte and uh, re-expansion of the oocyte. In order to protect oocytes from this re-expansion, we used the 1.5 molar sucrose for 50 seconds and we moved them uh, to 1 molar to 0.75 molar sucrose and we gradually uh, reduced the sucrose solutions 0.5, 0.25, Point uh, one to five sucrose, and finally we uh, put them in no sucrose solutions. So this is the initial uh, uh, our approach. Later on, uh, commercially available uh, uh, medias we are using right now uh, the equilibration solution at the room temperature 12 to 50 minutes. We checked uh, all sides around uh, eight minutes and we decide whether we are going to go 12 minutes or 15 minutes or increasing the 12 minutes, 13, 14, 15. And the final solution, it's going to be one minute. And warming, we are using uh, 37 centigrade for one minute. And uh, we are uh, moving uh, all sides, uh, two solutions for uh, dilution solutions, which is 0.5 molar across two minute, two minute. And then we dilute uh, this 0.5 uh, half, and then again we dilute this 1. Point, uh, uh, half, uh, uh, 0.25 in half, and then uh, then we put that in uh, washing solutions for minutes. So this way we get uh, somewhere around uh, uh, 90, 95 percent survivability with the oocyte uh, freezing, I mean oocyte vitrification uh, warming and uh, this is the uh, uh, steps that uh, we uh, follow 
this is the M2O site uh, before uh, vitrification uh, at the end of the 12 minutes and this is in the uh, vitrification solution and this is the reversal of the solution and we get it out from the uh, uh, last solution in this stage. And this is our uh, first uh, study that we published in uh, fertility sterility and uh, we saw uh, 111 uh, vitrified oocytes, I mean, we vitrified 111 oocytes, uh, 78 of them warm and 75 uh, of them survived and then we follow them uh, uh, we obtain uh, 75 uh, I'm sorry, 37 lysosis, which is 65% lysosis, 30, 31 of them transferred, and clinical pregnancy is 75%, and implantation rate 54, 54%. Of course, these are the donor oocytes, it's not the patient oocytes. So, next slide is the uh, patient oocytes. And uh, we look at the 48 patients, uh, freeze and fall, and uh, these are the uh, results. And uh, we have 8% uh, 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 miscarriage and 75% birth rate. And this is the <coughs> uh, singleton twins and uh, triplets ratio. This is the uh, baby rate per oocyte. And these are the numbers that we obtain from the patients. <coughs> uh, there are uh, different medias out there and uh, they're all uh, same basic uh, principles. And uh, basically, uh, uh, we can use any of these uh, commercially available medias in uh, uh, similar uh, fashion. And uh, however, uh, uh, recently, Vitro uh, uh, Life have uh, their own oocyte uh, uh, vitrification and warming. Uh, however, this uh, kit. Uh, you have to use it uh, 37 uh, degree. So uh, you have to manipulate uh, at 37 degrees. Now there's are the room temperature. Thank you very much. The uh, mic um, presentation is yours now. No, thanks. All right, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, perfect. Okay, great. Um, well, I am very uh, honored to be part of the, the group that was asked to talk about vitrification. Um, so excited to, to be part of the Progenesis Academy webinar. Um, let's see. So to start off with, uh, just a couple quick um, disclosures. I, I don't have any commercial financial interest in any of the products that uh, I'll mention, I was asked to talk about um, you know, my methods or our methods here to vitrify and some of the equipment and uh, media and tools and protocols that we follow. Um, so all of that, I don't have any financial interest in. Um, the Utah Fertility Center is um, associated with the Donor Egg Bank and we're uh, uh, proud of that association and their protocols are um, you know, proprietary and um, nothing that, um, that we'll be talking about or that I'll be talking about. Okay, so the order of things that we'll kind of uh, talk about today, we'll first go through embryo vitrification, uh, the setup, the protocols and techniques and tips, and then move on to um, the oocytes. Um, so here, the devices that we have um, we have liked have been the vitro guards that are um, supplied by Horigio. Um, like them for a couple reasons. Um, if you um, can see this little uh, kind of uh, dip here in the crowd device, 
that gives some uh, some area for the label. Uh, so you can fit a you can fit a total of ten devices in a in the goblet. Um, so we can we can freeze a lot of embryos in one goblet to help out with space. Um, we also you know the orientation is also that such that this this dip in the device is also where you load the embryo, so it makes it easy to to know which way is up. Uh, the devices are concaved, um, so it helps protect the device. And, and so those are the devices we choose to uh, vitrify both embryos and oocytes on. And then obviously you need some, uh, some pipettes and some, some tips. So those are also what we choose to use as well. Supplied by Cook um, or Riggio, they're both good products. Um, and then your setup, obviously we uh, plunge into liquid nitrogen, you just use an aluminum block in a styrofoam box and, and want to have it close to your uh, vitrification station. Um, the media of, of choice that we have liked here for several years has been the Irvine VIT kit and, and now it's a little um, more advanced with the Irvine VIT kit NX. Um, it's pretty simple protocol. I, I think that's important to the simplicity. Um, equals uh, repeatability, so we've liked that. So here, this uh, this kit is for freezing embryos and for freezing oocytes, they add in this extra wash um, step. Um, with this media, we have about a 98% uh, survival rate and our oocytes overall between donors and autologous patients are at 88%. So um, seeing some okay results there with eggs. Um, the vitrification protocol that we follow for embryos is, is nothing really more than what can be found on um, what the manufacturer recommends. Um, so the Irvine Scientific uh, protocol can be found right here. Um, and it's pretty simple, and that's one reason why we like it. You make a drop of 50 microliters of ES, and they recommend that it sit in that for anywhere from 6 to 12 minutes um, and just to make sure it collapses well. Uh, we do also um, uh, collapse the blast prior to freezing, whether it's through biopsy or if it's a freeze-all, then we'll, we'll collapse the embryo. Um, so let's see. Um, so at about seven minutes, once this timer's counting down, uh, we'll make a drop of VS solution, a 50 microliter drop, and then we like to make a list, a little teeny drop of about 20 microliters. We don't, we don't uh, measure that out. Um, and so you then will aspirate up this, uh, the embryo, um, plunge it into this media really quick, rinse it really quick. And, you know, obviously at that time you start your 60 second uh, countdown. Um, the, the Irvine Scientific Manual recommends that the embryos are in there a minimum of 30 seconds, but no more than 110 seconds. Um, our target is to start um, or to have them plunged by 60 seconds. We have found that to be um, a, a good amount of time in that, that BS solution. So somewhere around like the uh, 50 second range, we're getting ready to uh, remove that embryo out of the vitrification solution to place it on the crowd device. Um, Another thing that I wanted to kind of bring up is we try to be really consistent how far up you're pipetting the embryo um, into the pipette. So if you're looking at the pipette, we know we try to make little visual marks on there to suck it up so far, try to minimize the amount of media you're transferring over. Um, and then obviously the crowd device that's a little concave, that embryo is going to be protected sitting down in the bottom of that um, device. Um, they do have a little black marker on the end of them to kind of help with visualization under the liquid nitrogen. So we try to place the embryo, you know, a few uh, centimeters, millimeters up from that, just, just a little ways um, up from that uh, indication here, which is also shown there. Um, and then as leaving as little media behind as possible. And that is also facilitated by only aspirating that embryo up a short amount. And sometimes just through a little bit of surface tension, that embryo will just come out in a small little drop, which is ideal. You don't necessarily have to suck off any media if a, a very small amount comes um, out to begin with. And then, then, of course, we plunge it directly into liquid nitrogen. Um, 
so oocytes are the, you know, they're, they're a little more challenging to freeze. An embryo that's got many more cells uh, tends to do a little better, the vitrification process. But oocytes, the, the methods and techniques are, are very well um, you know, kind of established at this point. We, again, seeing about 88% survival rate. Um, but the steps to do it are a little more involved. Um, so to do that, um, the manufacturer recommends, and again, we follow their, their protocol uh, pretty closely. We do have some little modifications, um, but not much. So you make up 20 microliter drops. You make up a, a, a drop of the wash solution. And at that time, that same time, we make up two drops of the ES solution. Um, so then you will place the, the oocyte, you know, we only freeze one or two at a time per device. Um, and, and so you place it into that wash solution for, you know, it said they, they recommend a minute, but as we, we put them in there and go for 30 seconds or so. And then um, you using your pipette tip will run it across those two top drops and merge them so that the the solution slowly will, will kind of equilibrate. And you uh, have those merge drops for two minutes, leave them in that solution for two, two minutes. Um, and then kind of we pipette them up and down and move them back to the center of that first merge drop. And then using, again, your pipette, merge the top drop with that bottom ES drop. And then you have those three drops that are merged together. And then at that time, uh, we'll come along and dispense um, another drop, another 20 microliter drop of ES. So um, this is gradually equilibrating that, those oocytes to 100% ES solution. And so then at that time you move the embryo after that, that, that second two minute incubation, you move them over to this 100% ES drop for a total of eight minutes. So overall it takes about 12 minutes to freeze an oocyte versus the eight minutes for embryos. And as that counts down, as it's nearing the, you know, uh, under a minute left, um, then we'll come in and add a 50 microliter drop of VS. Um, and again, we like to add just another little small drop of VS uh, to use, uh, to kind of help rinse off and dilute any kind of VS that may have transitioned over. And so again, we'll pipette up some of the VS, just as you would with an embryo, um, good pipetting techniques, you'd suck that up, uh, dispense the VS around the oocyte, um, suck it up, drop it off in this VS, and then move it quickly over to the, the 50 microliter drop of VS. And I thought it was on that last slide, maybe it's right here. <laughs> um, and it is, it talks about the timing. So. It, Oocytes to vitrify them, you want them to be in the VS for at least 60 seconds, um, and but no more than 110 seconds as well. So we try, we shoot to plunge at 75 seconds. So when we get around the, um, you know, 60, 65 second count up is when we will remove the oocyte from the VS and place it on the device and plunge it. And with both oocytes and embryos, it's important to place them at the very bottom of the VS drop and they will float up and we just, you know, gently move them back down. And we also will move them around in a circle to keep them, uh, keep them equilibrating. Same kind of orientation and idea of placing the oocytes on the crowd device, you know, just a short distance from the, the colored indicator on the tip. And again, removing the, almost as much media as possible. Um, just a, a little video, or a, that's just a picture of kind of just a simple setup. You, we, you can do many at a time. Uh, this one was just, we just froze one. Here's a quick little video. I'm sure we've all seen something very similar to this with uh, um, sucking up a collapsed embryo, placing it on the crowd device, backfilling. That uh, happened so fast you couldn't even see it. It kind of glitched, <laughs> I feel. Um, but in that, she, she did make a, uh, a, a, not a very large drop of media, but enough that she had to aspirate off a little bit to, to get that embryo uh, to have very little media around it. 
Okay. Oh. Um, and then just uh, just to, uh, by way of note, like again, when we're freezing, when we have lots of embryos to freeze, uh, we will stagger them, um, especially like if they're, um, you know, have you can we will even do up to like eight staggered, but only four embryos at a time per dish, especially obviously if they're biopsied. Uh, but we'll divide a hundred millimeter dish in half, and then you can kind of start by placing them into this ES drop, this first one. Um, and then into the second and into the third and then into the fourth. And then as your timer starts to count down, we come in and as it's counting down to the um, eight minute mark, we'll come and we'll add some VS solution just as if we we're freezing just one at a time. Um, and then you just have to stagger them as you uh, begin to plunge and vitrify them. So just just runs through a quick little force for embryo freeze kind of routine that we, we do. Um, so at, at zero seconds, and this is counting up, the embryo will move from the ES to the VS. And then at 30 seconds, we move embryo two from the ES into the VS. And then we come back here to embryo one at about 50 seconds, we're removing it from the VS, putting it on the crowd device and plunging it at one minute. And then moving right down here to embryo number three, back filling, sucking it up, putting it into VS about one minute, 10 seconds, jumping back up to embryo number two um, and plunging it at about 130 again. So it's a total of 60 seconds Then jumping down to embryo four, um, back to embryo three and plunging it at about two minutes and 10 seconds and then waiting for that 60 second uh, VS uh, equilibration to uh, plunge that fourth embryo. So because of the eight minute equilibration that takes total, you can start these four and then about uh, four minutes into it, you could start embryos five, six, seven, and eight and stagger them that way, which is what we often do for freezing uh, more. Here we, um, we are lucky to have a young patient population. Um, I think our average patient this last year was about our, our autologous patient um, age was uh, 33 points. Six. So we have relatively young patients, and on average, we're freezing about 6.3 embryos per egg retrieval. Um, so there's often times when we have to freeze more than four. Um, but that's all I have. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, next speaker um, is Dr. Amadi, lab director at USC Fertility. Thanks, Ali. Hello. It's an honor to be part of um, Progenus Academy. Also, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nabil as well as Riley to having me here. So today I'm going to talk about more methodological than uh, you know the discussion. Looks like it doesn't doesn't work. So the topics would be. I'm talking about policy, then labeling of the you know, straws, and then uh, equipment and assessing needed re reagent, and go over some of the procedure step by step to review. I guess it's moving too fast. So for vitrification, we freeze only by order of physician. If we do not have order, we do not freeze. Our policy is to freeze maximum two eggs or cleavage stage embryos per straw. We do not freeze immature eggs. However, if there is any immature eggs with GV and M1, we culture till the next day. And if they are mature, we freeze next day. So we freeze eggs within three hours of the scheduled retrieval. 
so that when we thaw them, also we inject them after three hours or two and a half hours so that the window of six hours after retrieval would be counted. For the blastocysts, we only freeze one blast per straw. We vitrify everything one cc or higher grade. Our stages are one to six and quality A to D. We collapse any blast that are two grade two and above prior vitrification. Again, for the thawing, we only thaw when we have order from physician. Looks like I have technical difficulty. I can help you um, switch the slides, Dr. Ahmadi. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Next, please. So, label it. So, we do um, label a straw with patient name and date of birth. Obviously, we print a label. And also, we have a unique ID that would be a specified on that straw. For unit ID, we do have a letter that would be ABC for um, a straw number. And also we have date of freeze and followed by either E or O. E for embryos or for oocytes. For example, if an embryo is frozen on January 1st, 2010, and the first patient of being uh, frozen, and the first star would be A01010-01. O for the embryos, for the oocyte, and E for the embryo. When we do biopsy, instead of ABC, we, do, we just use number sign and embryo number. So if embryo number four frozen the same day, that would be embryo number 401010-1EV. And also, we have date and content of straw um, printed on the straw, too. Because those straw, uh, those uh, labels could be, I don't know, what, uh, rem would be peel off by itself. For precaution, we just put that number, unique identify number on that straw by marker and then paste. Obviously, last seven, seven, eight months, we already moved to electronic system. So we do um, using barcodes. These are examples of egg freeze, cleavage freeze, blast freeze, biopsy freeze, and donor. So how our label look like. Next, please. So these are storage tank we use. Um, it's very unusual to compare to other lab because we do have more than 20,000 embryos and eggs frozen so that we need a big tank. This is over here, one of them from the top. And this is closer look. So these are canister we have here. There are eight by eight. Um, we do have a canister. There are two racks of this on top of each other that here shows. And this is one of the, uh, you know, the box we, we use eight, eight by eight. If you realize we do have color, each column has different color and we have patient name on it. These are short cane. We are using it so that we can have more of two layer of this. This uh, stainless steel container we are using for vitrify and thawing embryos for the liquid nitrogen. This microscope for 
notifications and this one for following as it has stage work. Next, next please. How media and reagent. So we use urban scientific vitrification media, multi-purpose handling media with 12% synthetic serum, which regard we are using from Cooper surgical and short cane. Warming media from same urban scientific and the other consumable being used like center well, 100 mm dish, stepper tips and a pen drop and all stuff. Next please. This is how we do vitrification. We also use droplets. Our process would be the same for the eggs and embryos and blast. The only thing is timing is different. We have MHM droplets for the holding embryos or eggs. We have two droplets of ES and we have two droplets of vitrification solution. Here is showing exactly what we do. We have this tips cover media or MHM and this embryo ES solution. So we load embryos to be vitrified in all this one by one and then move them uh, into vitrification um, you know, ES solution in one half to two minutes interval. The way we do is um, pick up the embryos with minimum of the media and release it on top of the surface of the droplet and let it sink. It will sink between two to, two to four hours, uh, with, uh, two to three, uh, sorry, minutes will sink. And then after that, we move, we move them to next droplet. So while we do this, also we have 50 microliter of the vitrification solution added. So after uh, for the eggs, um, for the um, Philippi stage we, we use five to eight minutes. Um, after um, five to eight minutes, when are 80% expanded, or in the case of, case of eggs, um, are, uh, would be up to uh, 15 minutes, um, eight to 15 minutes. And the blast usually are on nine to 12. If they are 80% um, you know, equilibrated, then we move them to a uh, vitrification solution. The way we move them, we uh, use a new pipette pick up the solution from vitrification solution, and then and come over to the uh, where the eggs or embryos are, and pick up the embryos and, and move it into vitrification solution and um, try aspect in and out a few times quickly so that it would mix well. Uh, um, and then we move it to next droplet. But however, before moving the next droplet, we want to make sure that we washed the pipe from the corner so that we are not carry over those same media to the next one. So from the time we expose to vitrification solution, by the time we go to the straws should be 60 seconds for embryos for the blast. For the eggs, we would like to have 60 seconds in vitrification before loading on the straws. After that, we do the as usual plunge in liquid nitrogen and move on. Next, please. Warming solution, we have different process for the eggs and embryos. So because we wanted to avoid rushing embryo, embryologists. So we do um, some of the preparation the day prior to thaw. So the day prior to thaw, we um, usually check our calendar and depend on how many patients are we have and what we are thawing. Check the order, see whether 
order signed by physician. We locate and identify the straws, and then because we have big tanks, we move them from the actual location to holding locations. And then we also remove enough thaw straw and petri dishes to put it in the warmer incubator um, that it doesn't have CO2 to warm. We use one, two ml per each straw of the embryos and centerable dish. And we are taking two of two ml of um, thaw solutions per each two straw of the eggs and 35 ml per dish to, to keep it warm in, in, in incubator. We also make a dish for the embryo would be 0.5 ml of um, TS solution. It's actually a dilution solution and cover with the 0.5 ml of oil. And 0.5 ml of wash solution and 0.5 ml of oil cover with oil. These are kept at room temperature. For the oil side, we use same thing, 0.5 oil and 0.5 ml of uh, media DS covered with oil and 0.5 ml wash solution and 0.5 covered with oil in one dish that keep it at room temperature and make another dish of PVS, 0.5 ml oil covered or covering 0.5 ml of the uh, wash solution. So this one we keep in the same incubator, we are keeping those this. Next, please. On the day of thaw, when we do thaw for embryos, we use centerval dish and we remove the straws to be thawed. We verify straws with another embryologist, obviously after checking the order, and remove thaw solution and, and take out the embryos and then follow these steps. We dip in into these solutions that is um, warm at 37 degree. Um, we um, should be very quick when we are removing from liquid nitrogen, but we also want to make sure that not carry over it in liquid here so that warm up. And then um, when we see the embryos quickly, we, as, uh, we ask it in and out a few times so that we get rid of the carry over the vitrification media so that the embryo could be in order expanded faster after for after one minute, we move them to next droplets and then so on. For the eggs, we are using 30, 35 mm dish and four milliliter of the thaw solution. So in our experience, it worked best and most of the Egg bank recommended same process and move on. For egg after this step, then we keep them in incubator for three minutes because this dish is already warm at 37 degree. And then at final stage, we move the culture dish that already made yesterday in CO2 incubator and then keep it there. I believe this is my last slide. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sadruddin and she is the lab director at Dallas IVF. Sheila, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. 
All right, let me just make sure I have control. Okay, so I my talk today is focused on vitrification. Um, let me see. Riley, I, um, there we go, okay. Okay, I'll be focusing today on vitrification uh, protocols only. I did not include the warming protocols in my discussion today. Um, so uh, I just wanna go ahead and start off by making a note that all of the solutions or kits that are discussed along with the devices, I have no financial interest in them. Um, they're solely for the purpose of discussing uh, techniques. So let's go ahead and begin by, oh, I'm so sorry, let's go back. I think I skipped over a slide. Let's go ahead and um, begin by comparing the media types that we use for both oocytes and blastocysts. Um, for oocytes, we're using BitKit and X. Uh, one of my co-hosts, uh, co panelists discussed um, the procedure as well, so I'll be going over it briefly. Um, then NX is certainly a newer um, product in the market relative to the vid kit that was previously um, available or it probably still is available by Irvine or Fujifilm. Uh, the difference is the composition here with the NX solution um, is that it's HEPI's buffered and MOPS buffered, so it's a dual buffering system. The sugar is different, so it's uh, trehalose versus sucrose as a non-permeating cryoprotectant. And um, one of the main differences in sucrose and in um, trehalose is that there are two glycosidic bonds in trehalose versus sucrose, and um, it's a more stable sugar. Um, and it's made of two glucose molecules versus with sucrose is one glucose molecule and one fructose molecule um, connected with one glycosidic bond. Um, also the non, or excuse me, the permeating cryoprotectants is our DMSO and ethylene glycol. The entire uh, procedure of vitrification is um, conducted at room temperature. So per the manufacturer, the range is 22 to 27 degrees Celsius. The cryo device that uh, we prefer to use is the Rapid Eye by Vitro Life. Um, it is a closed system, which is one of the advantages is what we believe. Um, we use 150 micron stripper tip to minimize excessive um, carryover of solutions into the next solution that we're equilibrating with. As far as our blastocyst stage um, cells, we'll go ahead and use Rapid Bit Blast by Vitro Life. Um, we've used it for um, over a decade and our, we are very happy with our rates and uh, we're very happy with our survival as well. It is a MOPS buffer solution. Um, sucrose is a non-permeating cryoprotectant and propane diol and ethylene glycol are the permeating cryoprotectants. It also has hyaluron um, within the solution. It is uh, performed at 37 degrees Celsius, so it does require a warm surface. Um, again, rapid eye is a closed system, um, which is what we choose to use. And here we'll use a larger stripper tip relative to um, what we use for oocytes. We'll use a 300 micron stripper tip. Um, all of the blastocysts are um, collapsed using a ablation laser system. And so the next um, slide here, let's see if I can get to it. Okay, goes over our OSI vitrification protocol. So the protocol is very similar to one that was discussed by one of my co-panelists, co excuse me. Um, so I'll go over it quickly. Um, it does include three sets of solutions, the washing solution, the equilibration solution, and the vitrification solution. Um, so the solutions are laid out as follows. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the first one is the wash solution in which the oocytes are left for one minute. After the one minute time, um, the wash solution and the first drop of the ES are merged in a single uh, motion of a um, Eppendorf pipetter or similar. And um, we'll be sure to remove that dish from light. Wait an additional two minutes. So now we're at a total of three minutes in. And then we'll merge um, the, the top row um, together. So starting from the WS, we'll go to the ES and then to the um, second drop of ES and then back again, just to get um, a good mix. These are 20 microliter droplets um, and then wait another two minutes. So the total time in the top row is five minutes. Once the five minutes have elapsed, we'll go ahead and lay down a drop of ES 
um, the third drop and move over the oocytes to this um, drop number three of ES and leave them undisturbed for a minimum of six minutes up to 10 minutes. Um, there is no preloading. So we'll take the oocytes directly from the solution that they're in or the drops that they're in and move them over with, with minimal carryover of, of media and then place them on the bottom of the new droplet. Um, once we are at our six minute mark, we'll go ahead and examine the oocytes for re-expansion. And if they have reached um, ideally 80% re-expansion, but you know, anywhere from 60 to 80%, we'll go ahead and consider them to go ahead and move over to vitrification solution. At that time, we'll go ahead and lay down 50 microliter droplet of BS, and we'll start off by moving the oocytes from ES3 at the 12 o'clock position in BS. We'll leave the eggs there for 10 minutes and naturally they'll go ahead and float due to the differences um, in the solutions. And then we'll go back, pick them up from the top, and then we'll place them on the bottom um, at the nine o'clock position in the VS drop. Wait an additional 10 seconds, pick them back up, place them at the six o'clock position in the VS drop, wait about 20 more seconds, and then go ahead and make sure that our rapid eye is prepped and ready in our nitrogen bath. Um, at roughly about 45 seconds, we'll move them um, 45 to 50 seconds, we'll move them to the three o'clock position in BS and um, confirm that they're not floating and they're staying um, at the bottom of the dish. We'll then go ahead and pick up the oocytes and place them on the rapid eye straw with minimal media and then plunge the device prior to reaching 110 seconds total exposure time. Now, um, the steps after retrieval, we'll go ahead and make sure that the oocytes um, are denuded one to two hours post retrieval. And the exposure to the hyaluronidase solution is minimal. So under one, one and a half minutes, um, roughly about at 45 seconds, we'll go ahead and start to denude and then move them over to our culture media or rinsing droplets um, at that time to finish the denuding process. Um, proper rinsing is very important. Um, timing as far as starting vitrification is one and a half to two hours post retrieval, um, we want to go ahead and get the process started. Um, but the range is, of course, two to four hours. The stage that we freeze um, is M2 mature oocytes only. We will not uh, keep immature oocytes in culture and freeze the next day. Um, there is some science behind number of hours of um, oocyte maturation post ACG exposure or um, you know, even agonist exposure nowadays for final oocyte maturation um, in vivo. So we'll just, we'll freeze what we have as far as maturation um, at the denudation time post-retrieval. Vitrification system that we use, as I mentioned earlier, is rapid eye. Um, there is no clinical difference, no difference in clinical pregnancy rates or live birth rates in the literature. The paper I quoted here is just one of, this, uh, one of the studies. Um, can you click the next? Survival rate is also very similar. I found one study that actually noticed a difference um, stating that open device had a better survival. However, a vast majority of the literature that's on um, the more recent literature anyways, um, available now, um, does not show that there is a difference as far as survival rate between an open and a closed system. Next slide, please. Um, the tips and tricks for best practices that I have um, are that light exposure during the, the vitrification process should be minimal. Um, you, the range that the manufacturer recommends for temperature is 22 to 27 degrees, but I believe a, a tighter range um, offers a better outcome. So 20 to, 22 to 25 degrees Celsius um, is what we aim for. The hood fan should be turned off to minimize evaporation because these are micro droplets and then they are evaporating even in the short time that um, the cells are in them. No rinsing for us in the WS or ES solution. We simply place the cells in minimal carryover to um, ensure that they're equilibrating at the proper times and rates. We will move to, or excuse me, we will wait to move oocytes into the VS solution until we see that re-expansion. We do believe that timing in ES is less important 
compared to the re-expansion of oocytes that we're noticing. So once we reach, we're satisfied with the re-expansion, we'll go ahead and move the oocytes over to vitrification solution. We've also noticed that that helps increase our survival rate. Um, and then of course NVS, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we're, we're rinsing quite a bit because we want to make sure that the cells are completely equilibrated prior to plunging them in the nitrogen. Um, so this way, uh, the recovery is higher, the survivability is higher. Okay, so now blastocyst vitrification protocol, we are using the rapid bit blast by Vitrolife, and we'll use a four or five well dish um, with well number one with vitri solution one, well number two with solution two, and then well three with solution three. Um, the timing in each of these solutions is five to 20 minutes in solution one. We usually aim for about five minutes, maybe 10 at the most, um, and then move embryos over to well two for two minutes, and then again in well three um, for a total of three minutes. Now, well three does have um, solution three in it, but we'll make a micro drop um, taking solution out of well three into a dish um, and roughly about 20 microliters and then placing an embryo at the bottom of that drop. The embryo again will naturally float. We'll pick it back up after about 10 seconds of exposure um, in VS or excuse me, retreat three and then place it on the bottom again. Um, when we notice that the embryo is no longer floating, we'll go ahead and write at about 45 seconds um, load onto the rapid eye and then plunge the rapid eye um, into the straw and seal the straw. Um, we'll freeze at days five and six or when the embryos are of course less than 150 or excuse me 140 hours post um, insemination. The grading the progression of embryos are very important. Um, we want to make sure that we place high quality embryos in the freeze so that way it um, increases our chances that the embryos that we're warming are going to survive and usable for transfer. So at minimum, we want the blastocyst to be a full blast or an expanding blastocyst where zona thinning is present. And if we go over to the next um, slide there, I'll show you what I mean. So the image on the very right where it says um, BL or blastocyst, there is some zona thinning present. Um, however, it's still a very young blast. Um, we safely can freeze an embryo of this quality. However, we choose to wait until we see at least an expanded blast category. So this um, embryo that is the second image from the left um, is ideal. And then of course, we'll free freeze at the hatching blastocyst stage or the hatch blastocyst stage. Um, the vitrification system, again, is rapid eye by Vitrolife. Um, it is a closed system, so we do take some security in that. Um, the tools that we use are the 300 micron pipe, micro pipetter, and um, we collapse every single blastocyst to ensure that um, the timings that I mentioned, especially in solution one, where we stay close to the five minutes versus the full 20 minutes, is adequate for that equilibration process. Um, and of course, we'll do this on the warm surface. Um, if I can take, uh, give a one line take home message, I would say that um, go ahead and wait to plunge any cells um, once they're in the VS solution until they are no longer floating. When you experience that floating, um, it's a very strong visual cue that your cells are not ready and not equilibrated completely. So um, I would recommend that you wait until you don't see that floating anymore, of course, you want to be within your time limits. Um, and with that, I thank the audience, my co-panelists, Dallas IVF for allowing me to share their protocols, and then Progenesis Academy for having me present today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chida. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Anderson. He is the lab director at Aspire Fertility and EmbryoDirector.com. Uh, Tony, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. It would help if I turn the mic on, sorry. Um, our protocols, I'm not gonna go into the protocols so much. Um, our protocols are very, pretty, really pretty much very simple. Um, I like to use larger volumes. Uh, my 
uh, I will use 100 microliter drops of the equilibration solution, which is, you know, basically a 15% ethylene glycol DMSO uh, from Irvine. I've also used Kitazato with uh, some excellent results. And um, the three things I really try to emphasize when I'm uh, training people and when I'm doing some lab, uh, I'm helping some labs out try to investigate uh, problems is, you know, there's three things that I you want to always watch for in all areas of your lab, and that's the pH, the osmolarity, and the temperature. And particularly um, osmolarity with um, with all vitrification, because we tend to use small volumes, and we use small volumes because uh, the medias are very expensive. And so um, I always, as kind of a rule of thumb, if it's less than uh, five minutes, five minutes or less, I'll use a 50 microliter drop. If it's over five minutes, five to 10 minutes, I'll use a, a 100 microliter drop. And I don't ever leave anything anywhere more than more than 10 minutes. So when I'm freezing embryos, I will, uh, or I will put them in the equilibration solution for 10 minutes, and then I go through the VIT solution. And uh, I think we heard a number of speakers say today, uh, you know, 60 seconds. I heard as, as short as 40 seconds. As a rule of thumb, it doesn't matter if I'm freezing eggs or embryos. I I set a timer and I don't take it out before it hits that 60 second mark, and then I uh, I will load and plunge, and it's usually plunge within that that um, um, uh, 70 seconds, 75 seconds. Um, I always say a minute is longer than you think it is, and uh, I I will say to people like we can gaze into each other's eyes and see how long a minute is if you want to, but no one's ever taking me up on that. So I'm go to the next slide here. Um, a couple of things that I, I've, I've found over, over time, we, we, we've talked about some volumes here today. Um, I think all the cryo devices are great. All the medias out there are great and really, really pretty much the same. Uh, but one of the things I really do differently is my oocytes, I do pull off a lot of the media. There's very little media and, I, and I'll plunge them. Um, you'll notice the, the, the device on the right side has a little more media. And I started doing this because a good uh, portion of my embryos are biopsied. And so if you have any uh, tissue outside the zona and it sticks to the device, it tends to uh, tear that piece of the tissue. And so you still, it's still alive, but you still have um, uh, some, some necrotic tissue from that. And I've seen where we get them pregnant, but that we have you know, really high miscarriage rates after that, even with uh, uh, PGT embryos. So what I've done is, is I will um, leave a little bit extra media on for my hatched embryos or hatching embryos. If you have a zone around it, you can actually get away with pulling uh, more media off. When I first started vitrifying in 2012, um, we weren't doing that much biopsy. And so my rates were great, but then I saw them start to, to taper off. And I really think it had to do with um, that. And I try not to scrape it off with my tip. I will uh, run, I'll run my edge on the bottom of the dish. I use a 100 mi uh, millimeter dish. Uh, to put uh, 200 microliters of my thaw solution on, and it's 37 degrees, and I'll, I'll actually just run that up back and forth along the bottom of that uh, drop until it falls off, and it's almost like I'm causing some vibration on it, rubbing it pretty uh, aggressively on the bottom. Um, another thing I no note I took is um, I don't collapse any of my embryos. Uh, I know uh, before I was um, I was vitrifying, everything was uh, working well. And uh, then there were some, some discussions on we should be collapsing them. But, so I started collapsing them and actually didn't improve my results. So I stopped collapsing and then I don't do that. And another real key thing that I'll do is I will um, stir my tip in the liquid nitrogen because uh, we have, you know, we've all basically seen the bubbles. It's called the Leiden frost effect. And so when you have uh, something warm inside that boiling uh, liquid nitrogen, it doesn't really get in touch with the nitrogen and it really doesn't cool off fast enough. So it's really important, especially using the thicker devices to stir that around in the nitrogen. And so 
I'm a, I have a preference for the thicker devices and that's really kind of one of my take home messages here today is this, these are both cryotop devices. Um, I think it's a great product. I've uh, used them, I use cryolocks, uh, I've used Vitroguards all equally as well. Uh, nothing one better than the other. I will say that the thinner devices, uh, they freeze faster. So they, uh, they really, you know, especially freezing oocytes, they look like fresh oocytes coming off the, the, the flexible devices. But you can see this is just the weight of the, of the device pushing down on that and it, and, it, and it flexes and it bends. And so one of the things, we'll go to the next slide here. One of the things that I really kind of want to mention is, you know, vitrification means glass-like, and I, I think uh, Levent had a very similar slide like this. The, the drop on the left is the, is the VIT solution at 30% uh, ethylene glycol DMSO, and the drop on the right is your equilibration solution. You can see the ice crystals in that. So when you freeze the, the, the VIT solution under liquid nitrogen, it is glass-like. It looks like a piece like glass. And if I were to go push on the glass window over here to, uh, to my left, um, it would shatter. So we'll go to the next slide and you can kind of see what that is. I try to demonstrate this for folks. I will do this uh, with nitrogen and the, the picture on the left is, your, uh, is a shattered glass. But if your embryo was in the middle of that and you flex that tip, that embryo is going to get in there and it's going to crack. And uh, I have a, uh, a really good picture. This actually happened in one of our uh, embryos one time. We'll go to the next slide. And this is what, you know, we, we, we thawed the embryo and this is what came out. The embryo was just really cut in half like this. And, you know, it's one of the things we don't see. If that, if that device is flexed and, uh, and uh, is bent anywhere along the lines when we're trying to cap it or uncap it, um, there's, there's risk that we're going to uh, crack that glass like we would uh, a, the glass window or a, or a glass table. And it, if our embryo is in that, it's going to uh, basically uh, cut it in half. We don't see this a lot, fortunately. Um, this is the only time I've actually seen this. And so I, uh, I like sharing this with, with, uh, with folks and my students as well. And so really that's the take home message is, uh, you, know, you know, making sure that uh, you're using enough volume that you're not uh, worried about the osmolarity. Um, I, I once went into a laboratory where they were freezing uh, like 10 embryos and they had all the drops they were using 20 microliter drops, but the, the last drop that, what, that had the embryo put in had sat there for probably 15 to 20 minutes. And um, I, you know, who knows what the osmolarity of that drop is by the time that you know, an embryo actually got in it. And so I always say it's, it's, it's kind of like putting a goldfish into a saltwater tank. Um, you can pull that fish back out of the saltwater tank and put it in fresh water and it'll swim around for a while. And our embryos will look nice if, you, if that osmolarity changes a lot but it's not gonna survive, just like that goldfish isn't gonna survive after you put it into a saltwater tank. So I believe my next slide is my uh, thank you slide. And uh, I love to show the blue bonnets from Texas. If you ever wanna come out to Texas, now is the time to come because the blue bonnets are in bloom. So thank you, uh, Nabil, thank you for, uh, for Genesis and, and Riley for the invitation today. Thank you so much, Tony, for the presentation. And now let's uh, wait for the poll to be released so we can get some feedback from the attendees. Uh, Riley, if you could push that poll, I would appreciate that. Um, my first question to you guys, and I'm going to wait till the panel come, come in so we have ev everyone on the on this discussion table. Uh, but um, one comment that Sheila made, and I. this is a question for you, Sheila. Um, you mentioned the use of a dual sugar source um, as well as a, a dual buffer system. What is uh, the purpose of dual sugar and dual buffer? And whether if you have any data on, on a single versus dual as far as vitrification and, 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 and survival. Yeah, sure. So the sugar systems that I had mentioned were, um, you know, the differences in the VIT kit NX versus um, the previous method of the VIT kit, um, both by Irvine. And so 
with the literature search that I did before moving over to the Vitkid NX was that the stability of the non-permeating sugar, which is terhillose, is uh, more stable, meaning that the, pen, the um, dual glycosidic bond um, keeps the molecule stable and that it does not rotate on the glycosidic bond. Um, and since it is a non-permeating agent, it um, causes less fluctuations on the membrane during uh, the freezing process. So based off of the literature search, it made sense. And then based off of the data that was presented by, of course, the manufacturer, um, the rates were comparable. And so we decided to move over. Our rates um, are not lower and we haven't done enough cycles to necessarily for me to say that our rates are improving. So once we have um, more warming cycles, um, I'll be able to assess that and make a better determination. Um, as far as you mentioned, so the sugar and then, I'm sorry, what was the, the, the other thing? The, the dual buffer, the, uh, the hips, mops, dual buffer. Yes, that's just the composition. I wanted to be sure that um, I mentioned that there is a composition difference in the solutions versus the single MOPS buffer. Um, personally, I do not believe that that is a, a large contributor to outcome. Um, the single buffer system works just as well. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And how about the rest of the panel as far as uh, using a single versus dual system? Uh, Ali? We are using dual system and it works well for us. We never compare see whether there's any difference between single or dual, but it was new in the market and the literature was mentioning that it's more stable than, you know, hips buffer. So that's the reason we switch on that. That's great. Um, Aman? I agree. That's what we kind of switched to as well as a dual buffer, um, but very similar, just like uh, Dr. Um, yeah. said, yes, yeah, the same. Very good. Uh, Tony, what's your perspective on this? Um, I've never really used the dual buffer. I, I'm not a real big fan of MOPS buffered medias or anything personally. I uh, I like the heat these buffered. It's one that's just it's been worked well for me over the 30 years I've been doing this. I, I just stick with it. <laughs> yeah. And, and the dual sucrose, I actually, or dual, the trehalose, I, I think is great. Um, you know, I, you know, before I could afford medias when I, in my training lab, I, uh, I actually had to buy all the stuff and make it. And interestingly, it, it worked great. So I, I don't know that, that it makes a big difference, but uh, it, like uh, Sheila was saying, it, it is more stable. So uh, when things are on the shelf for a while, we need stability. Yeah, oh, we have a question from uh, one of the embryologists on the chat, uh, Annabella. Uh, she was worried about the expansion of the embryos after uh, in the warming station. I think Amon was talking to her as well. So she was saying that when she uh, transferred the embryos to warming station, then or warming media, then it expand too much, then they collapse again in the culture media, um, and then they stabilize when they get closer to, you know, the transfer stage. And the question she was asking is why these changes in expansions and how she can reduce that. Um, and I'll start with you, Sheila, if you can comment on it. Yeah, sure. So here I think we have an advantage um, in our lab because we're, we see devices come from many different centers because we're one of the preferred clinics for one of the embryo donation centers. So it's an advantage because we um, are receiving embryos um, from labs that practice ma many different ways of freezing, one of which is sometimes they collapse ahead of time um, using a laser system or just like a smaller micropipetter, forcing the blastocele to collapse onto itself. And so the embryo is now um, more, more or less in appearance similar to a morula. So it's collapsed completely uh -huh. versus some labs don't practice collapsing, which is perfectly fine. Um, what I suspect that this person is seeing is that if you can imagine the blastocyst in 3D, if the blastocyst hasn't been collapsed prior to freeze, um, then during the solutions, uh, the equilibration process is going to look different than one that has been pre-collapsed. So the embryo is going to fall flat onto itself. So looking at it from two dimensions, like from the top down, the embryo may appear expanded to someone where really it's flat onto itself. It's 
it's just, um, you know, there's no blastocele, it's just flat, it just appears wide. So at the warming stage, um, the cells are now rehydrating, but now there's functionality that returns in the embryo. So then it appears to be, the cells are more full in appearance, which could um, perhaps look like this embryo is expanding because the cells are more full. Um, but then the embryo naturally, um, because of the high sucrose content, will then collapse back down, which is completely and then two hours post culture, which is then normal protein and equilibrated solutions, the embryo will naturally, um, you know, go through the process of re-expansion. And so I don't necessarily see that there's anything alarming in what this embryologist is, is observing, more so just a difference in opinion of what she thinks she might be observing versus what's actually happening in the device or in the culture. Okay, th thank you so much. So you're thinking it's just an, uh, it's not a real expansion, it's just the the, the the visual impacts of the embryo that is, um, uh, but but flat was, upon itself, right? So the cells are rehydrating, which make them appear fuller. So I can see how that would be confused as re-expansion because she's seeing slight re-expansion and then back down again. Um, so the expansion it, it also could be possible because you know the embryo is dehydrated and you have. Sure. an osmotic higher osmotic level outside in that warming uh, media so water will get in eventually absolutely yeah but then what uh, what she was saying is maybe the protein level in the culture media or whatever that is will also cause the op uh, opposite effects during culturing and so the embryo now is going to shrink a little bit because there's a lot of salt and and other nutrients outside in the media is that possible I noticed that um, the embryo is probably the most collapsed during the warming solutions. And then by the time that it's moved over into culture, so at the end of all of the warming process, back into culture, I mean, it's still collapsed. It's not completely re-expanded. But um, in my experience, I haven't noticed that it, there's further collapse while in the culture media. And we do use a higher protein source in our culture media post-warming. Uh, hi, so, yeah, that's what she was saying as well. Uh, Amon, you have participated to this conversation. What is your input now? I think Sheila just explained it very well, in my opinion. Like, I kind of suspected, and that's, I think, what I replied to her is that it wasn't collapsed. But um, um, we also use like a 10% um, HSA in our thawing solution. So that may, I don't know, we obviously we don't look at them often after they're in the culture media. But we've seen the same thing where embryos that aren't collapsed um, have that same appearance where they just look full and they look big and then they shrink back down and they'll re-expand. So I think that was well explained. Oh, fantastic. Uh, any other comments from you, Ali, or, or from Tony regarding the expansion and whether that is a concern? Well, we, we are not using 10% um, HSA, so we haven't seen that, that effect. Okay, Tony. Yeah, yeah. I, I would, I'm just curious how, if you people, are, if people are using commercial medias, how do you increase the HSA without diluting out your, uh, cry, your cryoprotectants? But, but I mean, I don't change anything. I don't add any pro HSA or anything to my media. But I do, um, I did see that question, and to me, I think that's a good sign when an embryo is expanding. The the pumps are working. And uh, I don't look at my embryos a lot. If they're alive post-thaw, I put them in the culture. And when I go to transfer, if they're expanded, that's great. I did one today. It was re-expanded. I'm like, that's beautiful. Um, but if it doesn't re-expand, it doesn't mean it's not viable. My pregnancy rates are greater than 60% with, uh, without ever looking at them. And, you know, um, you, uh, some people will say they don't, they don't transfer if they don't re-expand, but... Uh, but I do, and they because they're live. You can see an intact cell versus a necrotic cell post thaw. Very good. Also, wanted to point out that um, even blast uh, without freeze, without vitrification in, in culture, collapse and re-expand over and over. It should be not necessarily yeah. because of vitrification thaw. Yeah, it's normal. Yeah, and I guess to clarify, we don't add HSA to our thaw media. Or any of the thaw media is it's the the culture media. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, that's right. I think that's pretty much um, standard, right? For anyone who adds protein, it's to filter media. I hope. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't add protein, but um, I, probably, I use a protein plus media, um, mm -hmm. like protein already in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Most of you seem to agree that the timing for uh, processing eggs for vitrification is two to four hours or, or five hours in that range. Uh, why is it important to have that tight um, time frame for vitrification? What happens if you let the oocytes stay longer? Uh, would that impact the quality of the vitrification and survival and, and the rest? Tony? Um. We're talking about oocytes, right? Yes. Um, I like to freeze oocytes within two hours of the retrieval. And really, you're just kind of mimicking ovulation. Uh, you know, we, we retrieve at 36 hours. We'll, we'll freeze at 40, you know, 38 hours. And then when we thaw, we will usually uh, do the ICSI. Like, we plan the thaw to do the ICSI two hours later. Very similar to the way it would be if we were do the retrieval at nine, we would do the ICSI at one. And so we kind of plan it that way. Very good. Um, Ali, do you, you mentioned that obviously you're using three hours max. Um, is that the, there is any particular reason why you are keeping that, uh, you know, time frame for all-site vitrification? Uh, yes, um, in our practice, we, uh, you know, in IVF cases, we do ICSI within four to six hours, minimum four hours. So we want to be in the same range uh, because of the cytoplasm maturation. So that's why uh, we want to freeze eggs as soon as possible. Usually half an hour to retrieve all the step eggs and start freezing. Before three hours, it has to be in liquid nitrogen. So that we thaw them also, they spend, they take some time for them to, you know, uh, uh, going through that cytoplasm maturation. So we want to inject after three hours. Good. Uh, Amon? I agree. And we do what, what, what Tony outlined, where we, we try to vitrify all sites two hours after the egg retrieval, and then we try to inseminate two hours after the thaw. Fantastic. And Tony? Um, yep, yeah, we were, we, we did the, uh, two, uh, two hours to freeze and two hours after thought I do ICSI. Very good. So we're going to get the poll results in a minute. Um, but I do have another question. Maybe we can go through the poll results and then, and then discuss the rest. So the questions we ask the audience is, do you use any commercial solutions, uh, or in-house solution for O-sites? and embryo vitrification, 2% uh, use in-house, 94% use commercial, and 4% said that they use both. Uh, we asked what the embryo survival rates post vitrification, 53% um, said over 98, 28% 95 to 98, 17% 90 to 95. And we asked them, uh, what is the oocyte survival? And then over 95, only 13% said yes. 90 to 95, 36% uh, 36, 36 says it's 90 to 95. Then 21% said 85 to 90. So it looks like the uh, survival rates, uh, most uh, responders here agree that Oocyte had less survival rates than embryo, and we will talk about that in a minute. Then we asked them, would you uh, vitrify a CC grade embryo? 15% said yes, 28 said sometimes, and 49% said no. Then the last question is, what brand of um, media do you use for vitrification? 15% uh, use Vitrolife, 9% Cooper, 55% Irvine, and uh, 34% said other and 2% all the above. And uh, I'm going to take your guys' feedback on the poll. What did you find uh, interesting in the poll? Sheila? 
Well, um, one of the things that sticks out um, is that Blossus' vitrification has been, you know, widely accepted. And so it's no surprise that a majority of the labs are noticing a very high survival rate. Uh, one of Another thing is that some labs are freezing lower quality embryos. So as I mentioned during my talk, you know, if you freeze borderline embryos, your survival rate is going to suffer. So that's probably self-explained there. Um, as far as the oocyte vitrification and the survival rate, I can wait to comment on that because I noticed that you would like to discuss it a little further. But I actually had a slide in my presentation that went over that. And then I went ahead and removed it thinking, that's not in line with the talk, but I'm happy to discuss that um, when you're ready. Thank you so much. Uh, Tony? Um, you, you mentioned how, like, you know, embryos or survival rates are higher than um, the oocytes, and, you know, I always, like, think of, you know, how it took over 100 attempts to get uh, Louise Brown, you know, the first IVF baby, and, you know, if you'd have asked me in 1994 if oocytes would ever be frozen, I was like, no, we, we can't make that work. We tried, it didn't work, and we're still moving on. Um, but, you know, fortunately, people persisted, and um, I, I don't really know that it's, you know, my, my blastocyst cryo su success rates were just as good with slow freezing versus vitrification. Um, but I do vitrify everything today, um, not because it's cheaper or faster. It's just, um, it's just, you know, basically no one slow freezes anymore. And so you almost peer pressure. Um, <laughs> but vitrification is why I did it, because vitrification that was better for oocytes. And otherwise, we'd still be freezing 100 eggs to get one baby out of it. Now we can freeze four eggs and get a baby bang there with, um, with donor eggs. Yeah, so I'll ask you guys the same question. Uh, starts with you, Amon. Um, so the question is like, what did I find surprising from the poll, right? Yes. How do you well, what what yeah what what did you find uh, interesting in the poll? Yeah. Um, the only thing that I well, I mean, it's all interesting, but I'm surprised <laughs> that anybody's still making their own media. <laughs> that surprises me. I'm 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 as lazy as they come. So I if I can buy it, I will buy it. I yeah. made enough media too. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, Ali? Well, same thing. Uh, making media in the house is not only time consuming, it's also uh, with it today, uh, you know, system is very difficult, especially, you know, the formulation, uh, uh, the commercial media is out there, basic formulation, but the complete formulation is not there. So we, we cannot really. Uh, make very good media in-house. Obviously, the cost would be much, much less for sure. So the other things I wanted to point out that um, in regards to um, egg freeze that um, there's a slower, I think, um, majority of center has um, more experience freezing um, embryos, not eggs, especially smaller center. So that could be, um, uh, you know, attribute to that lower success yeah but, but also we see that uh, frozen eggs do poorer poorer than uh, fresh eggs when it comes to fertilization and blastulation and cleavage and all that and what explanation do you have for it well um i put it this way um with a slow freeze pn embryos and eggs were the same size. But PN would survive very well. Egg did not survive. The size it was not, not only matter here, the composition. So yeah. eggs were, were more fragile than the embryos, the spindles, and, and you know the content of the, of the eggs. That's the main reason that when we thaw them, some of them will be arrested, some of them will not fertilize. So very good. Uh, Sheila, what's your perspective? Why, why frozen eggs do poorer than fresh eggs? Well, first of all, I don't believe that that statement is very accurate. Um, one, I, I believe that we're, you know, heading towards more and more warming cycles because to date, um, especially some of the smaller clinics have experienced more 
oocyte vitrification cycles, but not so many patients are coming back for oocyte warming cycles. But for the larger centers who are more involved in frozen oocyte cycles, or even um, cycles where patients are now starting to return and warm their oocytes for their own autologous use. Um, I will say this, uh, during my experience, coupled with the literature search that I did actually in for this presentation, was that survivability and success of eggs is directly dependent on the patient's age. So that is a primary and leading factor in outcome. Oocyte vitrification, um, more importantly, cry, you know, the um, the the fertility preservation aspect of it was is more so ideal for our younger patient population in hopes that they'll go ahead and cry out their eggs earlier in life and then um, return later in life and have a higher chance of, of conceiving. Now, um, that so coupled with age is also the skill of the scientist. So, so long as the embryology team is proficient in oocyte vitrification protocols, then um, the outcome is very similar as far as um, oocyte survivability, life birth, there is no difference in live birth and um, clinical pregnancies when comparing in, within their respective age population. So that's why donor eggs are so successful, as Dr. Anderson just mentioned, um, when it comes to having a live birth, you can just literally have like four to six oocytes and then you have a pretty decent chance at having a live birth versus the older patient population you need more eggs to get to that single live birth because you're right, there is lower survival, there is a chance of lower fertilization, um, and then of course cleavage and embryo division um, is affected some, somewhat related to age. Fantastic. Uh, Tony, do you want to make any comments? Yeah, one of the things that we're not really looking at is that embryos have jumped a lot of hurdles. They've gone through fertilization, they made it to day three, they've gone through the genome activation, now they're blastocyst. They're great embryos, and their permeability to the cryoprotectants has been shown to be much better. But if you think about oocytes, we, we know the permeability is, is not the same pre-fertilization. But if you if you just kind of just do the you know log, logic math with that, if if we did 10, if everybody here on the panel injected 10 oocytes, our fertilization rate across the board would be about. 80%, I'm going to guess, because that's what my fertilization rate is, is in my center. And that being said, when 80% of the oocytes survive, there's a lot of oocytes just, we weren't, they weren't meant to fertilize. It's, it could be user error, but if you train people correctly, it's not really that. So we're freezing some oocytes that probably never would have fertilized anyway. And so I think that has, that plays a role in it in, when we freeze the oocytes. So we're going to always probably see a little bit lower survival rates. And that's okay. Fantastic. I'm going to jump into we're very close to the end of the webinar, but I would like to go through one last question, which is witnessing. How do you guys use witnessing? What system do you have in place to, um, uh, you know, implement that witnessing step when it comes to vitrification of all sites and uh, and uh, you know, and embryos, and we know that there, are, there have been some incidences of um, a patient being transferred with the wrong embryo in certain places, and uh, how do you guys, this is really a, a nerve wracking issue, you know, you, have, you are storing embryos or, or all sites, you're going to use them maybe six months from now, a year from now. Can you tell us a little bit about your witnessing system? And I'll start with you, Sheila. Okay, um, we don't have an electronic witnessing system. We haven't invested in one yet, although the concept of it is certainly appealing because it reduces, you know, the, it takes the human concept out of it. Um, so there is advantage there. However, we are mostly, you know, the tried and tested method. Um, we, we have a chain of custody protocol that we adhere to very closely. Um, Dr. Um, Amadi went over a slide that had um, his labeling protocol. So we have a similar labeling protocol, which helps us with the chain of custody process. So for example, when an embryo is warmed, of course, we'll match all of the orders to the patient's record. We use um, two to three identifiers. And then the sticker off of the 
cryo device is affixed onto the patient's worksheet. So we do use an electronic medical record system, but the worksheets are secondary to that. Um, well, and then we, during, so when the embryo is ready for transfer, we use a two technician verification system to make sure that the dish that the embryo is coming in from matches the, the transfer setup dish that the embryo is going into. And then at the transfer time, the patient then again verifies the, um, her name, her date of birth on the transfer dish before transfer. So many, many steps um, of checking and double checking. And so the error is dramatically reduced. Um, knock on wood, we haven't had an incident. Um, so something that we're doing is working. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Amon? Um, yeah, very similar. Uh, we don't have an electronic witnessing system either. Um, but we have multiple checkpoints going into the freeze and then very similar to what was just explained coming out of the freeze. So we have someone verify that the labels, because we also have a labeling protocol, that the labels are correct. Um, and then we have them uh, verify the labels on the dish and under the hood with the dish, the patient's dish. Um, and then again, at the thaw, we verify it before we move it from liquid. So a lot of, um, hey, can I get a witness going on in the lab? Very good. Uh, Ali? So we do have biometrics from EIVF. However, when it comes to biopsy sample, witnessing system doesn't work. As far as I know, no witnessing system can differentiate two embryos from the same patients. So um, for that part, we have another embryology to worry about. Um, I meant when we are doing biopsy, and they want to freeze the same embryos, obviously, yes, we can actually barcode, but from biopsy to freeze, there's no any witnessing system can work. Fantastic. Uh, Pat, um, um, what, what was the, uh, uh, Tony, Tony, you, you, I think you haven't given us uh, your perspective. We don't have an electronic witnessing system. Um, we're, we're looking at getting IVF witness and the biometrics. We just got EIVF and we're having trouble getting that uh, um, everyone to, to work together with a witnessing system. But I think we might try to use both of them just to see how they work in, uh, together. Um, but the way I'm doing it now is very much like how everyone here is saying. Um, but I will recommend two books. Um, uh, the Checklist Manifesto by Ashok Agarwal. And there's another book that uh, called Inconceivable that they were IVF patients that had the wrong embryo transferred. And I actually got a couple of ideas from that book. And so one of the things we do is I don't like to be the embryology to carry the entire burden that the right embryo is being transferred. I, I like the doctor to come in and look at it. I like uh, to have the patient ID their label that you know, Ali elegantly uh, d displayed. So uh, they look at their own label, they look at their genetic results, and they know that that's their embryo before we transfer it. Um, there's a lots of other wet witnessing systems that we have along the way. And I look at it like, uh, I, I use it when I'm teaching people in the, in the training lab, I'll, I, I use the example of Swiss cheese. Like if it can get through one hole, there's another layer of Swiss cheese that will catch it. And I have a minimum of three uh, stop gaps so that I hope nothing ever ever goes wrong, but I, I will say that's why I have gray hair and it's blending into uh, this white background. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, well, we asked the audience, did you find this webinar useful? 97% said yes. And we asked them, would you like to see a webinar like this in the future? 100% said yes. This is the highest number we have ever had since we started the webinar sessions a year ago uh, that's definitely due to your experience and we appreciate your contribution in this webinar uh, we are coming to the end of the webinar uh, i'll give you guys a minute to introduce your practice or your interest and then we move on on closing the webinar and i'll start with you sheila Oh, thank you. Um, I'm the lab director at Dallas IVF based in Frisco, Texas. We are a um, five position program currently. I've been with the company for um, close to eight years and before then I was with Conceptions. Um, and um, I do have research interests in, you know, trifectoderm biopsy or trifectoderm um, 
specifically proteins of tephrectoderm, E. cadherin um, of sibling blossuses. So, you know, during my free time, which I have so much of, um, I'll try to research a little bit of that and see if that uh, materializes into anything. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, Amon? Um, I am the lab director of the Utah Fertility Center. We are also a five physician uh, practice. Uh, we, have, uh, we have the main labs in Pleasant Grove, Utah. And we have a little off sites um, labs in Idaho Falls, Ogden, Murray, and St. George. Um, yeah, and I've been here for oh, yeah, almost, two, almost 11 years. But, uh, yeah, love it. And thank you again for having me. Anna, thank you so much. Uh, Ali? I'm Ali Ahmadi, lab director at USC Fertility. We are an um, academic institution affiliated to USC. We do have REI fellowship program, so obviously we engage in the teaching and as well as uh, uh, in our research with fellow Aziz. Fantastic. Tony? Yes, I'm a uh, multi-site lab director for Aspire Fertility in the Prelude Network of Labs. Um, I also have my uh, embryo director, IVF Academy, where uh, I train embryologists. And, um, you know, I just recently got my own space and uh, built that out and um, actively always recruiting students to for either two day or uh, five day or even three month programs. Fantastic. Very good. Well, thank you so much, guys, for this great webinar. Next week on Wednesday, 3 p.m. Pacific time, we will have another webinar on implantation failure causes and possible solutions. Thank you so much, and I will see you next week. Okay. Thank, you, Thank you, Nabil. Thank you, Riley.